All right, can you guys hear me? Woo! Happy Sunday, everybody. Good morning, good morning. My name is Chantal, and I am so glad to be here with you guys today. I have to tell you that it is something really, it's just so beautiful to be able to look out at this today and to see people's faces, to, people, to see people singing. I mean, this is just so encouraging to my heart. I hope that as you can tell by everything that's been said, by what's around you, that today we are celebrating. You know, as you may have seen in our video this week or saw posted on social media or through our email, we are so excited to moving back into our building on September 13th, so next Sunday. But as our team prayed about and dreamt through what that transition uh, back into the building was gonna look like, we couldn't help but take a moment to celebrate and commemorate all that God has done during this season. Now have the last few months of driving church looked really different than what we were used to in the building. Absolutely. But was God in it with us the whole time? Was he still moving? Was he still pouring out his Holy Spirit? Were people's lives still being transformed? You better believe it. So as unique and challenging and even as creative as we have had to be in this season, I really don't believe that it was in vain. I really, really believe that God has used this season. And as a church, not just Yakima Foursquare Church, but globally, I believe that we have been reminded that the church is so much more than just a building or four walls or something that we do on Sunday mornings. The church, who we are, right? God and the church, the ecclesia, the body, of believers is not limited to just four walls, but God is outside of time. He is outside of space and he meets us exactly where we are, regardless of where we are. Now, as Jay kind of alluded to, as we celebrate today and remember all that God has done in this season, that isn't meant to discount or discredit all of the hardship that people have gone through in this season. I know for some of you that looked, uh, maybe looked like losing a job, that has looked like losing maybe a business or your business suffering, maybe even to losing a family member. And so even as we celebrate today, that's not to discount the hardship that we have gone through. We see you, we are with you in that. Celebration isn't a sweeping under the rug of the bad, but rather a focused intentionality on the good. So today we recognize that life has not been easy for us, but with excitement, we look forward towards what this next season has, focusing on the lessons that we have learned along the way. You know, even just today as we're here, and I was talking to one of our intercessors, Joan, and she was telling me something that she was reading this morning and a conversation that she had, and it just confirmed the sense that I have that today really feels like the turning of a page, almost like this is the last page of this chapter. And although we're still in this book that is 2020, we're, we're gonna start a new chapter. And I'm really, really excited about what this new chapter is gonna hold. So today we are continuing our series titled The King and we are in week 11 of this series. And you know a series is good when after 11 weeks there still is a lot to say. So I'm so excited. We are taking an expository view of the book of Mark, which means that we are pretty much going verse by verse, section by section through the entire book. Now, last week, Jake wrapped up his sermon by talking about what it means to pick up your cross and to truly follow Jesus. And we see Jesus foreshadowing his own death and what it looks like to put aside our own wants and our own desires for the sake of following God. And in this Last week and this week combined, we see a turning point here in the book of Mark. You see in the first half of Mark, you know, we are focusing on who Jesus is. We see that he is both God and man. He is the eternal king. And then in the second half of the book, right, we are seeing, we're seeing like a, a corner, we're turning the corner. And in the second half, the focus of this book is the, per it answers the, the question, what was Jesus's purpose here on earth? Why did he come? And so this next several weeks, as we continue on our series of the King, we're gonna answer that question. Why did Jesus come? What did he come to do? You see, as soon as Peter identifies Jesus as the Christ, from that moment on, Jesus begins to explain that he had to die. 
And he spoke about his upcoming death in a way that the disciples didn't truly understand. But what we will see today and in the weeks to come is that the gospel of Mark is now showing us why the cross was necessary and what it accomplished. Now, there are two major stories in Mark chapter 9 that we're going to look at today. There still is some uh, other scripture verses in that book, but we're in that chapter. We're not going to get to today just because of time. But the two stories that we are going to be focusing on today are the transfiguration of Jesus and the healing of the boy with the demonic spirit. So we're going to jump right on in. If you're following online, maybe with your, your Bibles, your apps, for those of you watching online, we are in Mark chapter 9. We're going to start verses 2 through 8. So it says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. The Bible even says that. Peter said this because he literally didn't know what to do. He was so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is the voice of God. He says, this is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. We're going to go ahead and pause there for a second. Now, the transfiguration was one of those stories in the Bible that's actually really important, but it almost feels complicated to understand. I'm not going to lie. Like, I lived my whole life hearing this story and being like, yeah, it's important, but I don't really get it. And then when I went to Israel last year and I got to see the Mount of Transfiguration where this event happened, I remember being so in awe and and just thinking to myself like, I have to learn what that means. I have to understand the significance of it because it's important. So the transfiguration really is just a fancy word for the human body of Jesus going through a glorification process. It was the glorification of his human body. Now, during the actual event of his transfiguration, his body underwent a change in form so that the Bible says that it shone as brightly as the sun. And at the time of his transfiguration, Jesus's earthly ministry was starting to come to a close. Now, there was, still, there was still work to be done. He wasn't totally finished, but he was starting to turn that corner because remember, his death had already been predicted. He had already uh, confirmed his identity as the Messiah, and he had confirmed his death and predicted his resurrection. Now, in this moment, he decides to reveal to a select few his divine glory. The transfiguration is important because it provides further evidence that Jesus was the divine son of God. And I don't believe that it was coincidental that this happened soon after Jesus had acknowledged himself to be the Christ, the one who left heaven's glory to come to earth. Now three of his disciples were able to get a glimpse of that glory. But part for me, part of where this story got really confusing and kind of tricky was when in the Bible it says that Moses and Elijah were present during that event. Because in the natural world, that makes absolutely no sense. We know that those timelines don't add up because Moses and Elijah lived far before Jesus came to earth. But the appearance made by Moses and Elijah was actually incredibly significant. And I I don't want you to miss this. Because we have to understand in the cultural context, every single believer at the time would have known who Moses was. Because Moses was equated with the Old Testament law that God had given to the people. So Jesus came and we see that Jesus fulfilled the commandments of the law and did the very things that the law could not do, right? He provided a solution, an answer for sin. Now, Elijah, on the other hand, was also a a really great symbol in the Old Testament, but he was a prophet, a well-known prophet. And his appearance on the mountaintop when the transfiguration occurred testified that Jesus not only fulfilled the law, hence Moses being there, but he also fulfilled the prophets. Okay, so this is a fulfillment of prophecy coming to pass. You see, Jesus does not point to the glory of God as Elijah and Moses and all of the other prophets had done in the past. Jesus is the glory of God in human form. 
The transfiguration is significant because it is, again, the glorification of the body of Jesus. And the appearance of those two other men testified to the goodness and the glory of Jesus. And I love this because if we remember back to the beginning of Mark, the account tells us that when Jesus was baptized, that the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. It says that the heavens opened up, the Holy Spirit, he began to fortify Jesus and prepared him for his public uh, teaching and healing ministry. And even in that story, we hear God's voice again, speaking out over Jesus saying, this is my son whom I love. Now here during the transfiguration, the father covers him once again with his presence, the light and what is known, if you do, if you do a study, there's what's known as the Shekinah glory. And it speaks of confirming uh, Jesus' identity, right? So when God covers him with his Shekinah glory, that is a physical manifestation presence of God. That is what that word means. So it says a cloud covered them. The cloud is the Shekinah glory, the, manif- the physical manifestation station. And Jesus, again, verbally affirms, uh, God verbally affirms Jesus's identity. Again, this experience fortifies him as he awaits his coming death. And it not only is Jesus the one who is strengthened in that process, but it is also the disciples who will be strengthened as they know that Jesus's death is coming. So you see that the transfiguration wasn't just some fancy trick meant to convince the disciples of Jesus's deity, but rather it was an experience of something that they already believed to be true and that they were going to need for what was ahead. You see, the transfiguration allowed these disciples to live out what they already believed. You know, Jesus had recently identified himself as the Messiah. They believed him. They had seen him do signs and wonders and miracles. They knew who Jesus was, but the transfiguration allowed them to experience it. They felt it, they saw it, they lived it. So then the few disciples that were there, we see that, uh, that this amazing event happens. And then the scripture says that these guys, Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they start coming down the mountain. And we're gonna pick back up in verse 14. And it says in verse 14, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Now we're gonna pause there for a quick second because I wanna ask you, for those of you that are parents or you don't even have to be parents, but, but can you just imagine for a quick second what it felt like to be that father? What it would feel like to be so helpless. His son was completely overtaken by this evil spirit. He can't speak. He has no control over his own body. The spirit throws him on the ground. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth. Can you imagine the helplessness that this father felt? He's at a complete loss of what to do. And this story is not just some made up story and it's not even a parable that Jesus used to teach uh, a concept or an idea. This is an actual event in history. This was a real father with a real son who had a real problem. This story is a graphic portrayal of the stark contrast between what we just saw Jesus experience on the top of the Mount, what is now known as the Mount of Transfiguration. And as soon as he comes down, the reality of God's glory and our broken humanity. They just have this perfect moment up on the mountain of God's glory. And the second they come down, there's this stark contrast of our brokenness and the evil that resides in the world that comes to steal, kill and destroy. And although the physical destruction of this boy in the story is evident, there is an underlying spiritual destruction as well that we just have to acknowledge. So Jesus responds to them, starting to back up in verse 19. He says, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. 
So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, asked Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father explained, exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. This spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many thought he was dead, but Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive out that spirit? And Jesus replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. So here in the second half of Mark chapter nine, we have the story of the the disciples trying to exercise a demon. But we can see from Jesus's response to them that they have been trying to exercise it without praying. Now, this is, this is not necessarily a judgment piece on the disciples because I know I'm the first person to say that there have been many times in my life where I have tried to do something on my own strength, out of my own power, and it just doesn't work that way. But how arrogant, right? How arrogant of the disciples to think that they could do such a thing without praying. How arrogant of me to think that I could do such things without praying. The disciples had massively underestimated how weak they were outside of Christ but do you know what my favorite part of this story is? And we're gonna start, we're gonna start closing up here pretty soon because I know it's hot. You guys are doing amazing. We're almost there, free snow cones at the end. But my favorite part of this whole story is the fact that the son who is suffering with this evil spirit, his father, not even the disciples, his father is the one person in this story who is willing to acknowledge his weakness. Because when his father asked Jesus to heal his son, Jesus' response is everything is possible for those who believe. And the father responds by saying, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. In other words, the dad is saying, I'm trying, but I'm full of doubts. And isn't that just the human condition? Is that not us? That statement resonates with me in deep ways. I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And just like that, Jesus heals the man's son. And in his healing, we can see that through Jesus, we don't need perfect righteousness. We just need repentant helplessness to access the presence of God. You see, Jesus could have told the dad, do you know who I am? Do you know what just happened up on that mountain? I am the son of God. I am fully God. Go, go maybe go repent of your sins. Go, go get right with me or, or maybe go get rid of all your doubt. Then come and ask me to heal your son. But that's not what Jesus says. Instead, when that dad says, I do believe but help me overcome my unbelief. The dad is showing his faith in Jesus and he is admitting that Jesus is his only hope. He has no other option. And we see here that perfect righteousness. We know this to be true. Perfect righteousness is not possible for us to achieve. And if that was the requirement, none of us would ever be able to enter into the presence of God. But when we are willing to admit that we are broken, that we are sinful, that we are lacking without him, that we are in need of help. We are welcomed into his presence. And can I be real with you for a moment? These last several months have been really hard for me. I know that they've been hard for all of us. They've been challenging emotionally, spiritually, mentally. And I feel like I'm on the other side of things now, which is great. But for a while there, I honestly felt like I was in survival mode, like just whatever I can do to survive. That's where I was at. And for a little bit, I even found it difficult to want to spend time in deep prayer or to spend time in the word of God. And if I did so, I, I, 
I'm not even gonna lie, I felt like I did it out of obligation more than a desire and joy, because that's where I was at. I was just in survival mode. And I found myself asking the Lord, why? Why did you have us transition right before all of this? This is really hard. And so there we were navigating, what does it look like to lead a church in the midst of a worldwide pandemic? And then there I am on my face before the Lord asking him, Lord, what does it look like to lead and to navigate a social justice revolution, racial reconciliation? What is, what is our role as the body of Christ in that? And then we get to navigate, all of us, a very divisive political climate. Let's just call it what it is. And it felt like no matter what we did, there was just landmines everywhere. And no matter what we did, we were gonna step on one and someone was gonna be mad at us. Like, that's just what it felt like. And let me tell you, finding myself in a place of absolutely not knowing what to do, not knowing what should we do next, not knowing and just, just feeling so not in control. We were so not in control was absolutely the most perfect place that I could find myself. Because just like the dad in the story, I found myself saying to Jesus, as I processed this and took this to him, I said, okay, I know that you have called us for such a time as this. I want to lead, but I recognize my inadequacy. I recognize that we don't have the answers. And so it was one of those like, I do believe, but help me become, overcome my unbelief. I, we want to lead, we want to be strong. We want to lead this, this community back to Jesus, but we're at this place of helplessness where all we could say was, help us, help me, because we have nothing else. And it was in that place, in my weakness, it was in that lack of righteousness that God is strong. And as God has met me and continued to meet me and sustain us in this season, as we have pursued God in a state of repentant helplessness, I have sensed his presence like never before. And if you're here today or you're engaging and watching with us online, let me encourage you with this. Regardless of where you find yourself, whatever the circumstance is, it could be really big, it could be kind of small, it could be life-changing, it could, it could be whatever it is, you are never too far gone. Because regardless of your circumstances, you too, like the dad in the story, can run to Jesus with whatever belief that you have whatever it is that you have to give. The Bible talks about how we can move mountains with the faith of a mustard seed, that is that big. We do not need very much faith, but we come to Him with what we have and we say, help me with where I'm lacking. And there's this notion amongst believers and non-believers alike that in order for us to be able to come, maybe back to church, maybe to pray, to even be in the presence of God, that somehow we have to get right before Him before we can enter into His presence. And I just wanna say that that notion that we have to get all cleaned up before we come into his presence is such a lie. That is such a lie. Because no matter how hard we try, we will never be deserving of God's love and grace outside of the cross. So if you're waiting until you have it all together, I'm just gonna let you in on a little secret. It's never gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. You know, whether you've never given your life to Jesus, or maybe you did a long time ago and a lot has happened since then. Or maybe you are a committed follower of Jesus, but you just need the reminder. Coming into the presence of God is not about walking in perfect righteousness. It's about being in a posture of repentant helplessness. And it's okay to be in the camp that says, God, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. I believe that as we cry out, God will meet us. And as we experience him, not just in head knowledge, but in our heart, like the, like the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, they knew who Jesus was because they had seen him perform signs and wonders and miracles. They had seen the way that he loved people, but they experienced him on that Mount of Trans, uh, Transfiguration. As we continue to experience Jesus, I believe that our, I really believe that our faith will continue to grow because this is what I know to be true. Jesus came to this earth. He lived a perfect life. 
so that he could die on the cross for our sin and our shame and our brokenness and even our lack of belief. And in doing so, he made a way for us to be made right with God. So whether you identify with the father in this story and you are watching someone that you love go through something incredibly difficult and you feel helpless, or maybe you identify with the boy in the story and you feel like you have zero control of your life and you don't know what to do. Or maybe you're like one of the disciples who got to experience Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and you have seen God's glory and you've tasted his goodness and you are really aware of how you are lacking. Our reality this morning is this, God's power is made perfect in our weakness. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. It is not by our strength that we are saved, but by the power of the cross. And that is why we celebrate, not because life has been perfect or easy these last several months. It would be really, really silly of us to think that we can throw this big celebration because life is one big party right now. No, we celebrate because God is made perfect in our weakness. He is strong. And I really believe that God's presence is here this morning. I believe that his presence is here on this lawn, in your cars. I believe that God's presence is in your home as you're watching online. I believe that he's here. And if there's someone here today in person watching online, and maybe you know that something has to change, something in your life has to change. You cannot keep going the way that you've been going. You don't have it all together, but now you know you don't have to be cleaned up before you come to the Father. All you have to say, all you have to say is, I believe, help me with my unbelief. The Bible says that to be saved, all you have to do is believe in your hearts and confess with your mouth. So if you're here this morning, if you're watching online, if you are in need of a fresh start today, we are going to pray as we close up this morning. And I believe that this is the prayer that is gonna usher you into a relationship with the Lord. And if you already have a relationship with the Lord, this is the prayer that can get you back on track if that's what you need. This could be the prayer that encourages you and reminds you that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. So if you're watching online and you'd like to respond, there's a button that, you, that says uh, that you wanna give your life to Jesus. If you're here today, you can raise your hand if you want, you can stand up, you can do whatever you want. Do whatever you need to do to make it real to you. I see that, that's awesome. Zach, who's our youth pastor is online. He's your online host. If you're watching today and you wanna give your life to Jesus, pop it in the comments, let him know. He's gonna be there to talk with you. So let's go ahead and pray. And I encourage every single one of you, regardless of where you're at in your walk with Jesus, this could be the prayer. Again, I really sense that this is the turning of a page to end a chapter and we are starting a new chapter. So Jesus, we come before you today and we say thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the cross. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to have it all together to come before you, but that we can come broken, we can come bleeding, we can come, we can come a mess. And you welcome us exactly as we are. And so Jesus, this morning we come before you and we say, we believe. Jesus, we confess with our mouth, we believe in our hearts that you are our savior. And we say, help us in the areas of unbelief. God, help us to experience you in a way, in a way that changes everything. And so Jesus, we pray that this really would be the start of a new chapter. God, that we would lean into you like never before. And like we have said every single week, our outside circumstances do not determine our inner joy. It does not determine what you are doing in our hearts. So Jesus, we say, come, fall afresh, Holy Spirit, have your way with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.